Happy 2024. Happy New Year, everyone. It is great to have you all uh, watching and listening to the Changing Minds podcast. We're still in season four. I think we're in season four. Yeah, yeah, we're in season four. And I'm Owen Fitzpatrick, in case you don't know. But today we're going to be talking about the language of persuasion. And in particular, I think this episode is going to be extremely valuable for you. So get a pen and a paper, obviously not if you're driving or if you're running, if you're running or if you're driving, make sure you take care. You know, I sometimes have accidents while I'm running. I actually tripped and fell and broke both arms in the last five years when I'm running. I know what you're saying. Well, that's terrible. That's unfortunate. I feel so sorry for you. And I'm like, no, don't worry about it. It's okay. I'm back. I'm feeling good. I'm back running. But I do know what's really important to do when you're running is to look and pay attention to what's in front of you while you listen to my podcast, sharing wisdom inside of your eardrums that hopefully will reach your brain. Today, we're going to be talking about, as I mentioned, the language of persuasion. This is going to be the first part of a potentially two, potentially three, potentially even more series, but it's going to be part one because today we're going to talk about language that helps you to change people's minds or more accurately, language that helps us to help other people to change their minds. And that's really what we're going to be looking at is what is it that you can do to become more effective at getting people to look at things from a different perspective. A lot of the work I do around the area of beliefs and the area of belief leadership, which is a field that I've been building for the last number of years, is really about helping people to understand why we believe what we believe, how beliefs work, and therefore how they change. And while we're only going to touch on one different aspect or one different element of how beliefs change here today, I do want to make sure that you walk away with a set of linguistic skills that enable you to be able to work with people, help people, talk to people, converse with people, have productive conversations, whereby the person that you're talking to finds it easier for them to look at a situation from a different point of view. So before we get into the language of persuasion in this part, changing people's minds or helping people to change their own minds, the first question we need to ask ourselves is, well, why is it difficult? Why do people struggle? And why do people resist against changing their mind? Now, there is uh, the principle of reactance in psychology, which is that we have a a natural tendency to react against what someone is trying to convince us to do. And that's something that we develop very early on. It's part of us developing our autonomy as we grow up. But that's really just a small part to why we don't change our minds in response to someone when they're trying to persuade us. It's that not only are we trying to maintain our autonomy, it's also that in an effort to do that, what is known as the confirmation bias kicks in. And the confirmation bias is where we look for evidence uh, to prove our own conclusions are true, what we think is true. And we dismiss evidence that contradicts those particular claims. So we make up our own mind in a lot of different areas. We figure out what we believe. And as a result of that, we try to hold on to those beliefs. And when opposing evidence comes in or when someone tries to persuade us, even if their argument is very compelling, It's not going to be that compelling to us because we're constantly trying to discount and argue against their argument. And remember, any of the holes that we find from what a person is saying to us, we won't always necessarily tell them what those holes are. So we'll just be thinking them ourselves. So someone tries to convince you that A is true. And inside your head, you're pointing out all of the flaws in the argument that A is true. And maybe some of them you might articulate to that person if you're having like an open discussion but more often than not you're not doing that more often than not you're inside your head disproving whatever it is that they're thinking so this is problematic now we live in a very tribalized world we've talked about this i talk about this quite a lot in my inner propaganda newsletter plug if you like a newsletter every week with a sort of a relatively long form article to dive into which helps you to change the way you think it's a great newsletter to subscribe to and it's on ownfitzpatrick.com forward slash newsletter that's ownfitzpatrick.com forward slash newsletter see i don't do ads at the moment like a lot of other folk do i just stick them into the conversation in a very sort of natural way like you see how natural that was ownfitzpatrick.com forward slash newsletter anyway the point is that this confirmation bias kicks in and as a result of that we're very very defensive to any argument that might usurp our perspective or our point of view. 
And so what we need to be able to do is learn, well, how do we help people to change their own minds? And notice that I'm deliberately being very aware of that. That's something that I've been sort of talking about for quite a while. I also know that in the great book, How Minds Change by Dave McRaney, he talks about, you know, it's not about you changing people's minds. And he's talking about how minds change, even though the title itself is more accurate because it's not that you do change someone's mind, it's that you help another person to be able to change their perspective and therefore to look at the situation from a different point of view. So there's a, a few different things that I highly recommend you do if you want to be able to be better at helping people to change their minds. The first is to be able to find common ground and connect with them. And connecting with them means using a number of different tacts or a number of different approaches. One is what we call using truisms. And when I say truism here, I mean when you say something that you know is true for the other person. So you know whatever you say here, the other person will agree with. And when you can stack a number of those truisms, a number of those true statements together, and then what happens is you're starting to create an association for the listener so that they're starting to get used to listening to you speaking sense. They're starting to get used to listening to you saying things that are true. And therefore, they're more likely to keep their mind open and less likely to have confirmation bias kicking in because confirmation bias kicks in, remember, whenever we start to hear arguments against us. So if you can start the conversation and the first you know, couple of minutes, you're not saying anything that they can disagree with, then you put yourself in a much better position to really get them to hear you and to connect with you and to hear that you're coming from the right place. As well as truisms, you also have the option of being artfully vague. Now, being artfully vague is something that a lot of politicians do very well. They talk a lot and they never say very much. Sometimes consulting can be like this. Sometimes business, quite frankly, is like this, where people talk for a while, but they don't actually end up saying much. Now, when I say artful vagueness in this sense, I'm saying you might start out by using this. And the reason you start out by using this is because if I say we want to move forwards, or we want to tackle these issues in the most effective way, no one's going to disagree with it. And so, again, since the purpose of the first few minutes is to make sure that no one's able to disagree with you when you're creating as much compliance as possible. If you don't know specifically what they're going to agree to, what is true for them, then sometimes you might need to use more artful vagueness where you say things that you know they can't disagree with. So you can either use truisms or you can be artfully vague. But either way, what you're trying to do is you're trying to make it so that they're listening to you, they're still paying attention to you when you're communicating and conversing with them. The third option that you have is that you also can use what we call yes set questions. This is known as a sales technique as well. It's whenever you, for example, ask questions and the answer to each question is yes. So you're looking for something that will help you, yes. And you want this to benefit you long term, yes. And you want this to be able to solve your problem, yes. So again, you're stacking the yeses up. The whole point of these three tactics, whether it's truisms, artful vague statements, or indeed yes set questions, is that what you're looking to do is you're looking to build a sense of credibility with them. You're building a connection with them. You're making it so that they can feel that you're speaking their language. Now, inside of that, one of the things that you will eventually do as you're building up a sort of a coherent stream of different truisms and statements and whatnot is that you want to then anticipate an objection or anticipate their perspective or way of thinking. So, for instance, they might turn around to you and they might have an issue with what you're trying to convince them of. So let's imagine you're selling something to them and their objection is that it's too expensive. Well, if you know that that's more than likely going to be their objection, then what's critical for you to do is to anticipate that ahead of time. So you're saying a number of things that you know that are true for them. And then what you do is you bring up the particular objection. So you can say, for example, I know you're looking for the best product possible and it's important for you that this product lasts a long time and it's critical that this allows you to be able to get the results that you want. Truism, artful vague statements so far, we're all good. And I understand that this can seem pricey. So notice the way even I'm bringing up their objection. I'm not saying I know this is really expensive. I'm saying I know this can seem pricey. Some people might think X. There are some perspectives that might lend themselves to this interpretation. I mean, that's a little bit long-winded, very long-winded. But it's really about some people might think this might seem, some people will feel. So you're talking about what people feel. You're talking about what people think. You're talking about how things might seem. 
And what you're doing with that deliberate language is you're trying to get them to associate sort of doubt around that particular objection. So when they think about the objection, they're not thinking about this as being airtight. Instead, you're making it very clear in the way you phrase it that this is something that is up in the air and kind of doubtful. You're also not saying, I know you're thinking that it's expensive. You're saying, I know some people might think, or I know this may seem pricey. And again, you could even change the word pricey if you wanted. You could say, you know, premium. You could use euphemisms like that. Or you could even say expensive or not quite as cost effective as you'd like it to be initially. Like there's a whole host of different ways you can do it. But the primary thing is you want the uncertainty around the whole statement. The words themselves can help, but not as much as the actual whole statement itself. So you bring up that particular objection. And then the next word that you would then use is the, the word but. And the word but is a word that gets you to focus your attention on what comes after it. Now, it doesn't mean that they won't hear what comes before it, but it does mean that they won't be paying much attention to what comes before it. The word but itself tends to focus our attention on whatever the response is, whatever the, in our case, the rebuttal would be. So you would say, it might seem pricey, but when you realize just how valuable this is and how long this lasts, you'll understand how much it actually saves you. So you're giving a strong rebuttal, of course, but you're doing it after the word but so that you're emphasizing that rebuttal. And therefore, the people that listen to you are much more likely to pay attention to what you're saying at that moment in time and less likely to be focusing on what their objection is. Now, some people will say, well, what about me saying, yeah, but why doesn't that work? Well, it doesn't work because if you say, yeah, but it's pretty much the equivalent of saying no, because you're immediately dismissing the yes, and you're focusing all of your energy and effort and attention on the rebuttal that you're giving to them. And also, that means you're already involved in a conversation where they've made statements. And if a person says something is true to you, and then you try to argue against it, they've already sort of dug their heels in, and they've already made the statement explicit, which means now they kind of might feel publicly like they have to defend their argument. So that makes it trickier. Whereas when you bring it up, and you're not saying that they're saying it, you're saying some people might think, or it seems this way, or it can seem this way rather, then it allows you to help them to give themselves an opportunity to change their own mind in the comfort of their own head, which is pretty cool. Now, as you move forward on that, and once you've sort of started the rebuttal process, as you're using language to try to make them see things from your point of view or perspective, the next thing you might want to do is dive into language like because. And so what that means is, so it's a great study by Professor Ellen Langer. And this was done in a university whereby she would go up to the front of a queue of people, a line of people, and ask them to skip the queue. And what she found was that when she gave a valid reason, because I'm in a hurry, versus a non-valid reason, because I have to make some photocopies, which is the whole point of trying to skip the queue in the first place, people were almost as likely to be okay with it, with the flawed reason as they were with the good reason, I'm in a hurry. And what that tells us is the power of the word because. Because acts like sort of a trigger word, that whenever you hear it, it's like A because B. A is the conclusion because B is the evidence. And so what that means is, flips this. So what this means is, is really B, which is the evidence. So what that means is A is the conclusion. And so whenever you use the word because or you use the expression, so what that means is you're more likely to make whatever comes before because seem more true and whatever comes after. So what that means is feel more true as well. And this is a very, very powerful example of how language can trigger us to believe in ideas more effectively. Now, I will say that it's important to recognize that you do need valid evidence. You can't just, you know, lie your way to the top. You can't just pretend things are true and, you know, bullshit people about them. You do need to be able to be clear about some of the variations of what you're coming up with. You need to make sure that you're coming up with solid evidence that drives home your point. And when you're doing that, leveraging words like because, and so what that means is can make it even more persuasive because the shortcut in people's mind tends to hear these words and it tends to trigger them to be more likely to believe in what it is that you have to say. The next thing that will be useful for you when you're trying to help a person to change their mind is asking questions. Now, we'll probably do a whole other thing just on 
questions that you can use to change minds and questions that you use for things like therapeutic change. But for here, let's just say that the questions that you ask are designed to get people thinking about the reason why they're doing what they're doing. A lot of the best ways to help people change minds are things like deep canvassing, street epistemology, two things that were mentioned in, in you know, a good amount of detail in, in the book I mentioned earlier, How Minds Change. And these approaches, typically speaking, largely work based upon the idea, number one, of making the person feel respected, especially with deep canvassing. Very similar to the truisms in Arthur Vey, you're, you're finding common ground with the other person. You're trying to let them know, look, I'm not on the other side, right? It's not about sides. I'm connecting with you. I can find things that I have in common with you. I can find things that I agree with, that you agree with. And I just want to understand this. And then when you ask questions from this point of view, what you're looking to do is you're looking to understand how they came to the conclusions they did. So you're trying to understand what experiences led them to believe what they believed, what ideas or events happened in their life that led them to make the conclusions that they're making. And when we start to do that, when we start to look at that, we're getting their point of view, we're getting their perspective, we know what their beliefs are, let's say. But now we're beginning to get them to unpack their evidence and their set of beliefs in that way. And as they do that, we can then ask them more questions. And the point of the questions is to really help them to see, without saying it, that they might not be as accurate as they think that they are. In other words, their sense that they're correct, their sense that they have a lot of strong, robust evidence that proves that they're right, might not be as strong or robust as they think it might be. And when we ask questions, invariably the person starts talking and stuff like that. But as they do it, as we ask the right kind of questions, and we're doing it from a curious point of view, not from a gotcha perspective, but from a curious point of view, more often than not, they'll start to realize, well, I'm not as 100% sure as I thought I was. And sometimes you can even ask that question. You know, I think this is from street epistemology. You can ask, you know, on a scale of zero to 100, 100 being absolutely you'd pump your life on it and zero being I don't know at all. How certain are you of this particular idea? And that kind of, again, gets them to rate it. And then if they say, for example, this is more motivational interview in style, but if they say, for example, you know, 90%, you say, why did you say 90 and not 100? And as they answer you to that question you've asked, gets them to answer and explain what elements they're uncertain of, which is very helpful. Because then they start to break down, well, I'm not sure this, not sure this. And before you know it, they're arguing against themselves in that way, which can be very, very helpful. Again, sort of a motivational interviewing type approach or question. The other thing that you want to do in terms of changing minds or helping people to change their minds is you want to get into the habit of being able to share your own perspectives, your own point of view. So you let them share their perspectives and then you respond with your own point of view and your own way of thinking. And when you do that, invariably what happens is you start to create the experience for them where they can look at the same situation they were looking from, their own perspective, and they can look at it from your point of view. And again, you're not telling them you're right. You're simply sharing your beliefs, your thoughts, and where you got yours. Now, obviously, you'll be confident that your logical arguments and your reasoning and the experiences that you've had are quite strong. So when you're sharing it with them, you'll feel more comfortable that it's going to be received well. But when you share that perspective after hopefully they've realized that their point of view is not as solid as they might have thought it would be, then they're more likely to be open to your perspective. Now, I think it would be important for me just as we sort of bring this to a close to talk about the ethics of this a little bit. So I can hear some people going, what gives anybody the right to change someone else's mind? And I understand that question. The issue really is that we're constantly doing it and we're constantly trying to convince other people. And what we try to do is we try to rely entirely on argument in order to do that. But the problem is so often the people that are the best at arguing, so often the people that are the best at creating a compelling argument are not always the people with good intentions, nor are they the most clear-headed people either. So 
being great at arguing means that effectively you can almost prove any point quite well. You know, you can prove your conspiracy theory is correct. You can prove that it's absolutely fine to go to war or to kill these people. If you're good enough at arguing, you can find your reasoning. You can master the art of using certain tactics of rhetoric and tactics and leverage cognitive biases in a way where you flip them around and you use them on other people or you point out in other people the weaknesses of their argument based on those. You can target in on one specific thing that a person said and destroy them and try to destroy their credibility. You can attack the person themselves. There's all sorts of ways to win arguments in this influence war that we find ourselves in. Not to mention that with the advent of social media and with uh, media all being about the attention we get, we are finding our minds are being changed constantly. And what I'm trying to do in the work that I'm doing, which is around inner propaganda or changing minds, this podcast in general, is I'm trying to get people to take more control over the beliefs that they have. So in effect, I'm trying to get you to be able to be better at changing your own mind while I try to get better at changing my mind. And so then that brings us to the ultimate question. Well, how do you know when you should try to change another person's mind? And I think the answer is based upon the situation. You always have areas where you disagree with someone else, where you want them to see it from your point of view. And if you believe passionately that them believing in your perspective or seeing things at least from your point of view if you believe passionately that that is going to lead to a better world for them and a better world in general, then that's when I think ethically that the idea of helping a person change their mind is the right approach. Now, it doesn't mean you'll be right, but even in the approach that we take, we're not using some fancy Dan manipulative tactics. What we're doing here is pretty much connecting with what we already know they believe in, right? Giving our arguments, sure, and using language in order to do that. But we're looking at really understanding where they're coming from, and their point of view, their perspective, and what that means. We're asking them to share their perspective and let them talk it through. And then we're sharing our perspective. So as opposed to this question, well, is it right to do this? Well, you're going to be doing it anyway. We're, we constantly try to change the minds of the people we talk to. Invariably, we realize that logic isn't enough and being right is not enough or feeling right is not enough so what we have to do is we have to accept that they're going to have a different point of view or a different perspective to us and so with that in mind in order for us to be able to decide when to do this we need to be comfortable that we are trying to make things better and when we then do it the way in which we do it is much more about trying to understand them and getting them to understand themselves getting them to understand us so that they can see that maybe there were certain mistakes made when they came to the conclusions that they made. What we're trying to do is enlighten them or light up and show them the erroneous mistakes that were made in the dialogue. And by the way, that also means that we have to recognize the same thing for ourselves. Because if you were to have these conversations, you need to be prepared to do the exact same thing with your own point of view and your own perspective. You need to see the flaws inherent in your own argument. And I believe when we start to do it like this and we start to have conversations like this, then we put ourselves in a much better position because as opposed to us trying to bombard people with all of these facts that we're clutching onto and then them responding with their own facts and then us sending them videos or propaganda and them sending us and, and instead of that failed attempt, maybe just maybe this approach I'm talking about today can help us understand each other better. So if you're looking to use this for business, it can be very helpful, very useful. Once again, you're looking to connect with what they already believe in, demonstrate respect while you do it. You look to overcome their objection. You look to get them to be more likely to believe your point of view by bringing to the fight or bringing to the argument. Definitely the wrong uh, metaphor. Strong words that trigger uh, more certainty. And then you're looking to be able to share perspectives, hear their perspectives and ask them questions about it. And both of you understand where you're coming from so you can think more critically about the situation. Hope you found this useful. Hope you found this valuable. And I hope you've got a few ideas that you can bring away with you into the future so that you can be even more effective 
at helping people to change their minds, starting with your own. This is, after all, Changing Minds. And this has been The Language of Persuasion, part one. I look forward to, at some point in the future, covering part two, where we're going to be looking at sales and relationships and whatnot. There's some great linguistic skills there. But for now, take care, be well, continue to believe better, and may the force, as always, be with you. Bye for now.